Welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast, the podcast where we explore the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. Join us as we delve into topics such as consciousness, spirituality, and personal growth with expert guests and thought-provoking discussions. Get ready to expand your mind and discover new insights on this journey of self-discovery. Now here's your host, Peter Michael Deeds. I have the privilege of hosting a prolific writer, an inspiring educator, and an avid adventurer, Amanda Sue Creasy, who wears many hats. Not only is she a high school English teacher shaping the minds of tomorrow, but she's also a freelance writer with an impressive repertoire. As a doting dog mom of two, Amanda's love for animals extends beyond her family to her five years of dedicated volunteer work at the Richmond Animal League, a proud member of James River Writers, the Poetry Society of Virginia, and the Virginia Outdoor Writers Association, Amanda's passion for literature, poetry, and the great outdoors is evident in everything she does. When she's not in the classroom or typing away at her keyboard, you can find Amanda out and about exploring the world with her dogs through activities like walking, hiking, paddleboarding, and running. She's also a seasoned traveler, crisscrossing the country in search of inspiration and new adventures. Amanda's journey as a writer began early with about 40 journals and diaries to her name, a testament to her lifelong dedication to the written word. Her debut novel, An Expected End, showcases her storytelling prowess and her work has graced the pages of Chicken Soup for the Soul. Her poetry, outdoor journalism, and nature photographs have earned well-deserved recognition from the Poetry Society of Virginia and the Virginia Outdoor Writers Association. A graduate of Michigan State University, Amanda holds an undergraduate degree in German, English, and secondary education. Further fueling her passion for the craft, she earned a graduate degree in creative writing from the University of Denver. So let's get ready for an engaging conversation as we unravel the layers of Amanda's creative process, her experiences in the literary world, and the intersection of her great love for teaching, writing, and the great outdoors. So without further ado, let's welcome the multi-talented Amanda to the Transcendent Minds podcast. Amanda, welcome. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you. And thank you for that beautiful introduction. That was lovely. And I'm happy to be here. You're welcome. So give us a snapshot of your background, Amanda, in your own words. I moved around a lot as a child. And I think that my childhood moves probably play a pretty pivotal role in the way that I see the world, the way that I see relationships and people and life in general. I've always been an animal lover, as you mentioned. Recently, we actually acquired another animal. We have a a rescue parrot now named Archie. And I would say my background, I never aspired to be an educator. I was one of those kids and young adults who really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I knew some things I didn't want to do with my life. I had always loved writing, though, from the day I could pick up a pencil. My parents tell me I've been writing. And I did love playing school, and I was always the teacher. I have three younger siblings, and I always played the teacher, and they always played the students. So I suppose becoming an educator and a writer was a natural trajectory for me, which may be why I never had to think about it. It just was the path that was the most natural for me to follow. Beautiful. Tell us a little bit more about your debut novel, An Expected End. Yeah, so an expected end, the I call it the kernel of the book, was an idea that occurred to me when I was in high school, actually. And I always had just this strange thought that every year we have so many anniversaries and so many special dates that we celebrate that we know when they're coming. Like, you know when your birthday is every year. You know when Christmas is every year. You know when your wedding anniversary is, your child's birthday, all these dates that are important to you. But the one date that you cross every year that will be important to you, that you can't have any way of knowing, is the day that you will die. And that just fascinated me in a curious sort of way, not in a morbid sort of way. It didn't scare me. It wasn't a dark thought. It was just a curiosity. 
Like any given day could be the day that I'll die in 10 or 20 or 50 years. And I don't know which one it is. I tried explaining that to my friends. And I don't know if I just didn't have the words or if we were all just too young to conceptualize that, but nobody understood. And it just became my private musing. When I was in graduate school, I tried to write a poem about it for a poetry course and the poem didn't work. I needed a bigger space to explore the idea. And in 2018, I started to explore this question, this idea through a novel manuscript. And now it's a book. And it's a book that I've been delving into when I was in the States. And I was really fascinated by it. I haven't covered all 65 chapters, (laughs) but I've got halfway through it. What is really interesting in, in terms of what you just said is that we will all die. It's unknown, but it's certain, but we don't right. know when. And I was reading the prologue, and in the prologue, we meet Marshall at the day of his enrollment in an intriguing experiment. Mm-hmm. And the mysterious enrollment office reveals that Marshall, like others, is aware of his date of departure, a predetermined time for his departure from this world, and he's somewhat indifferent, but gets assigned to this, I believe it's experimental group B, Yeah, and he's he's instructed to download the DOD or date of departure experiment. And the enrollment office refers to the day of departure as a due date in heaven. Yes. How does this concept shape the world that Marshall lives in? It shapes it in so many different ways. One of the things I tried to do was imagine the effects that this revelation would have on society, on the economy, on the collective psyche. And so one of the ways it affects things is we already have an industry around death. Of course, there's funeral homes, there's death doulas. Death is an industry. But with this advent of information being able to decide or to know when we're going to die, there's a whole new industry that has developed or a new, I guess I should say, a new area of industry within the death industry. And it's almost become kitschy. Death becomes, instead of a serious business or a serious, almost sacred topic to just being very everyday. For some people, that's a good thing. For some people, it's not a good thing. And there's a whole marketing strategy around convincing people to enroll and convincing them to participate in this experiment. And then there's all these different kinds of companies that sprout up as a result and different kinds of apps that sprout up. You can download and purchase the bucket list app that'll keep track of everything you want to make sure you do before your death day arrives. There's all these new dating apps that people are are doing based around their death days, like Together Forever is an app that tries to pair you with a partner that has a similar death day. So neither one of you will have to live alone for very long once one of you dies. And all these different things that people, there's a death day celebration that's become trendy in Marshall's society where you're supposed to do something deadly on your death day because you know it won't kill you because it's not your death day. And just all these different little types of venues and apps and technologies that are developed Largely as a way for people to make money off of this knowledge. Mm. Because Marshall also mentions that some participants keep countdowns. Um, How do you think knowing the exact time of one's departure would affect an individual's outlook in life? Yeah, I really think it would depend on the individual. I think if we look to case studies of people who are diagnosed with terminal illnesses, for example, and they don't know an exact date, but they have a range, maybe they're Doctors have told them they have three to six months or six months to a year. They have a sort of general idea of when their time here is going to come to a close. And I think some people probably go through the seven stages of grief. There's the first stage of denial and so forth. And I think it makes some people really appreciate the time that they have left and want to make the most of it in the ways that they know how that are the most fulfilling to them. And I think other people, it's probably, and this is what happens to my protagonist, Penelope, it's devastating. And it's hard for them not to waste the time they have left feeling self-pity, feeling regret, feeling guilt because of things they hadn't done yet, or a sense of grief for the things they thought they were going to get to do that they have just learned they won't have time for any longer. And I think those are the three buckets that I see being the biggest categories. But if you really whittle it down to an individual, 
every individual, I think, would react to that news differently, depending on A, how soon or late their death day is, B, their experiences, and C, probably their age. If you learn your death day when you're 15 or 20, that might be a lot different than learning it when you're 50. Mm. I'm very curious about Marshall who faces this unconventional office celebration for his death day. <laughs> and it's a tradition marking the T minus years until one's predetermined departure. And it seems that Marshall's uncomfortable with the festivities and reflects on his strained relationships with his colleagues and finds solace in his bond with his dog, Toby. How does the tradition of celebrating death days contribute to this tension? Yeah, so Marshall is very awkward around people. He wants to enjoy their company. He wants to enjoy them, but he struggles. And he is uncomfortable with the idea of a death day. He's uncomfortable with the idea of a death day party. Frankly, he's uncomfortable with the idea of a party in general. He doesn't enjoy that type of social activity. But he feels like people have begun to view death with too shallow of a lens, that this commercialization of the death day has taken away from the sanctity of dying and has removed some of the mystery that makes end of life, I don't want to say meaningful or mysterious, but that makes end of life almost sacred or people handle it typically with respect. And that has dissipated in this society because it's so normalized. Knowing when you're going to die is so normal that it takes away some of the gravity of the knowledge when everybody has it. And Marshall is uncomfortable with celebrating it because he still feels like death is serious and he still has a sense of gravity and a sense of respect for whatever this transition will be. And he doesn't want to necessarily celebrate the end of what he knows and the end of what's familiar. He sees it as almost tacky. And he also feels as if people are still afraid of death, but they're cloaking it in this fake frivolity to make it bearable. And he would rather people just face the emotion and deal with it head on instead of pretending he feels as if they're pretending to be celebratory because it's easier than facing the facts. I was also curious about the connection with his dog, Toby, because Toby seems to me to be a source of comfort for Marshall. And I was wondering how the presence of Toby contrasts with Marshall's interactions with humans. He has somewhat of the ideal classic relationship with his dog, Toby. People have, people for generations have said that do- dog is a man's best friend. They don't judge you. They love you unconditionally. They're forgiving. There's no politicking in a relationship with your dog. There's no manipulation. There's no game playing unless it's fun, <laughs> like fetch or something. <laughs> and so he feels very comfortable with Toby because he feels accepted and understood by Toby. He does not feel accepted and understood by people. He feels like they often have ulterior motives or best case scenario, like he just doesn't understand them. He can't tell when they're being sincere versus sarcastic. He can't tell what their motives are in conversations or actions. And he feels like things are much simpler and much more straightforward and much more genuine with his dog, Toby. I think dogs are sent to us to teach us fealty, love, compassion, friendship. And they're only here for a short while. Yeah. But the dog is a dog and they're true to what they are. They don't have a hidden agenda as such or a different persona. And it's a beautiful thing that we can glean as Toby has done, is that the the dog can actually teach you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I feel like people have a lot of lessons they can learn from dogs. And Mm. I'm very grateful to another writer, actually, who, as you said in my introduction, my dogs are a huge part of my life, like huge. I can't even, I can't emphasize that enough. And when I first started drafting this book and completed the first draft, there wasn't a single dog in the book. And one of my fellow writers said to me, Amanda, you don't have a dog in this book. And everyone in the writing group was like, I can't believe you don't have a dog in your book. Like you talk about your dogs constantly. They are your whole life. And I was like, you're right. I can't believe I don't have a dog in this book. And when I went back to the next draft, it was so natural and obvious to me where and how 
a dog could fit in. Uh, and it was not work to put him in at all. Toby should have been in there from the beginning. I think I just needed to get the bones of the book out, bones of the manuscript out before I could work in as important of a character as Toby is to Marshall. In a way, the absence of Toby initially really brought the presence of him. You could layer that in. I found something which had a very dark, humorous touch in the book. It was about the cake that was shaped like a tombstone with the phrase, heaven is waiting on it. And my question is, how does this symbolism play into the themes of the story? That is such a good question, and I'm very glad you asked it, because as I worked on revising this manuscript, it took me several years to to really get to whittle it into what it is. And the more I read back through it and revised it and worked at it, the more it became evident to me that what I had really written was a retelling of the fall of man, was a retelling of the story of Adam and Eve and the tree of knowledge and all of these biblical stories that many people are familiar with. And so the heaven is waiting is a nod to some of the themes of the book. And the characters' names are also chosen very carefully in relation to the Adam and Eve story and the fall of man. Of course, the knowledge of a death day is the knowledge, the tree of knowledge that Eve ate from. Penelope is tempted by her best friend, Bea Adams, to find this knowledge or find this knowledge out for herself, even though she resists it in the way that Adam resisted the temptation from Eve. Her fiance, his name is Everett, the male version of Eve. And so all of these biblical allusions play into this idea that there are some things as humans we maybe just aren't meant to know. And maybe we can live more fulfilling lives if we don't have some pieces of knowledge that we think we want, but we pursue anyway, <laughs> perhaps fatalistically. Maybe it's not within our perceptual permission to know, but I wonder whether it is within the permission to know at all. I've made notes about each chapter and I want to move on to chapter two because I see that chapter two introduces us to Penelope Hope. Yes. And she strikes me as a woman who finds herself in a sudden life-threatening situation. While she's waiting on that street corner, she witnesses the accident involving an elderly woman and a non-driverless car. And in a split second, she intervenes, instinctively intervenes, putting herself at risk and suffering injuries. And as she wakes up in the hospital, she grapples with the consequences of her impulsive act mm -hmm. and contemplates the complexities of life, death, and the societal expectations surrounding predetermined lifespans. Now, that split-second decision to save that elderly woman, how does this action reflect on her character and the societal expectations surrounding predetermined lifespans? So by today's standards, I think Penelope would have been hailed a hero, right? This right. beautiful young woman was so much ahead of her, risks her own life to save somebody else. And not only somebody else, but somebody else who presumably has already lived quite a full life and reached old age. In the society in which Penelope lives, where most people know when they're going to die, it's she's a curiosity. People aren't necessarily celebrating this. Even her doctor is like, why in the world would you do something so stupid? You have your whole life ahead of you. She was going to die today anyway, he reveals to her. And then she has to grapple with the knowledge or the thought, rather, of knowing I had 46 more years allotted to me. Would I throw those away and jump in front of that car to save somebody else? If I knew I was entitled to 46 more years, would I take that risk? Whereas not knowing, she didn't have to consider that. She saw a person in danger. She saved that person without really a second thought to her own well-being. Because in the way that we exist now, without knowing when we're going to die, we don't know. We could die tomorrow, and we want our actions today to be meaningful. And what Penelope did was meaningful to her. She saved somebody from suffering and at least in the moment from dying. But she has to question, would I have done that if I knew that the powers that be had given me 46 more years? I, would I throw them away to save this person? Or would I go, I know I have 46 more years and I think I want to keep them. 
that encounter with the accident, for me, it raised questions about my relationship with time, the choices I make in the face of uncertainty, because it seems clear to me that the chapter prompts reflection on the trade-off between knowing one's fate and embracing the unpredictability of mm-hmm. life. And in our own lives, how often do we actually contemplate our mortality? Are these moments when we choose, when we consciously choose between time and money? And how does this influence our decisions? Because reflecting on this, the question came up in me was that how does the fear of the unknown, such as the uncertainty of our lifespans, impact the choices we make in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole book really is meant to prompt readers to ask questions similar Mm. to that you just posed. And I think for me, and again, I think this is something that every individual would answer differently. For me, not knowing the span of my life, what's important to me when, first of all, how often do we really come face to face with choices like that, right? For most of us living in the U.S., at least not on a daily basis. Um, we have that privilege. We're blessed with that. But when I am faced with a decision that could be life or death, potentially not for me, but for another living creature, the question I ask myself has nothing to do with how long I'm going to live, has more to do with the value of my life. So the quantity of time is much less important to me than the quality of the time because I don't know the quantity. So that doesn't necessarily factor in. At my age, in my 30s, Do I assume I have 30, 40 more years left? Yeah, I assume that. But there is the uncertainty out there. An accident could happen. You never know. And so the time that I have, the time that I have right now in this moment, am I using it in a fulfilling, meaningful way that if something befell me tomorrow, I would have lived a worthwhile life? I think maybe the question for most of us, more so than time, because we don't know the time, like you said, that uncertainty. We do know we will die. We don't know when. In what ways do you think we can strike a balance between planning for the future and living in the present without being overwhelmed like so many are by the fear of death? Isn't that the age-old question, right? Mm -hmm. Live for the moment or plan for the future. It sometimes feels like those two ideas have to be mutually exclusive and that they're at war with each other. You're either planning for the future constantly at the price of not living today Or you're living today in the most fulfilling possible way, but not building anything for your tomorrow. But I don't think that those necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. I was listening to a fascinating podcast yesterday. You might be interested in it. The Atlantic puts it out. I think it's called How to Keep Time. And they discussed this very issue. This particular episode was called Wasting Time or Waste Time. And they were talking about the idea of living in the moment versus the present and how the present is constantly becoming the future. You're just jumping from present moment to present moment to present moment with every breath you take, every blink that of your eye. It's a stumper of a question. I don't know how you strike the balance. And I think the balance is probably different for everybody, depending on their personality and their perspective. Some people really feel fulfilled if they are laying the foundations for a comfortable future. Other people are very much more prone to living for the now because the future is not guaranteed. Whereas in the book, you can have this expected end, right? And that can help Mm. you determine. That's one of the beauties that people flout about this technology is if you know how much time you have, you can use it better because you can say, okay, I know I have 20 years. These are the things I'm going to have to plan for. These are the things I want to make sure I experience. These are the things I want to make sure I achieve. That when you remove that uncertainty, maybe you can live a more fulfilling, productive life because you know how much future you need to plan for. Like right now, for example, I work full time and I really contribute aggressively to my retirement fund because I'm living with the hope that I will have a long, healthy retirement that I need to finance. But If that's not true, then all the hours I have put in at work and all the money I have saved be for naught. And there's just no way to know. Another thing that strikes me in chapter three is Dr. Zait. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, Dr. Zait. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Dr. Zait. The imagery, the contrasting imagery of the black shirt that's worn by Dr. Zait within the hospital's white environment for me, adds a layer of symbolism 
Yes. How does this contrast contribute to the atmosphere and themes of the chapter? So the black, of course, is somewhat terrifying to Penelope shortly after this mm. life or death experience. The black is reminiscent of not only death, but the unknown. Because, of course, even if you know when you're going to die, you don't know how and you don't know what comes after, which is one thing that really nags at Penelope. She's like, what good is knowing my death day going to do me when I don't know what happens after that? I can't plan for what happens after that. Nobody knows what it is. And so it's not necessarily her death day or death that's scary and dark. It's the what comes after. Is it an end? Is it oblivion? Is it reincarnation? Is it some other plane of existence? What comes next? And so what terrifies Penelope is the unknown. And the black is somewhat symbolic of the things you can't know, the things you can't see, namely what comes after death. The white is more symbolic of light and lightness and shedding light on something, the knowable. When something's in the light, you can see it, you can't know it. It's the opposite of blackness or darkness. And the juxtaposition between the black and the white is an attempt to draw a clear line between the knowable and the unknowable. Because even with this somewhat godlike knowledge of when one is going to die, you know nothing beyond that. Beautiful. I love the symbolism in the book. Penelope's, the way that she reflects on the concept of death days and the unpredictability of accidents, I wondered how does her unenrolled status impact her perspective on life and death compared to those who are enrolled? Yeah, so Penelope tries really hard not to let the knowledge that other people have affect how she lives her life or affect the choices she makes. Mm. And I think one of the things that is hardest for her is she's almost like a Luddite, right? Like for a long mm. time, I held out on getting a smartphone, but then you just can't. There are very few people nowadays who can get by without a smartphone because even if you don't have one, everyone has one and they want to share their contact information with you a certain way. And they expect that you're going to be able to get the pin that they send you for some location where you're both supposed to meet and so on and so forth. And we craft our lives around this new technology. Penelope is a holdout, but everyone around her best friend, her customers, people, her neighbors, they all have this knowledge that they assume she has as well. And they're functioning differently because of it. And so even her relationship with her best friend is somewhat complicated and strained because her best friend wants her to have this knowledge and believes it will make her life better and can't understand why Penelope is reluctant. And her fiancé, who is also not enrolled, he wants them to enroll together um, as a romantic gesture, as part of their commitment to each other. And so there's all these societal and personal pressures on her to give in and live life in this new way that she's resistant to. Even in her job, she bakes death day cakes and she hates it. <laughs> she loves baking. She doesn't like baking the death day cakes. I remember when I was at San Francisco airport, I was just waiting there in the lounge and I was just looking around and everybody had an umbilical cord attached to their phones. Yeah, for sure. I was just talking as a teacher, one of the biggest battles I fight in the classroom is the battle between me and all my students' cell phones. Mm. And of course, there's punitive measures I can take, but that can be damaging to the rapport that you're trying to build with your students. Yeah. And so I'm trying to use them to police each other. So I created this system where if anyone in their group is on their cell phone, their team loses a point in the game that we play all class long. Yeah. Okay. And then the third time they lose a point for their team, then their phone gets taken. And one of my students had already had two strikes. And I reminded him, I'm like, hey, your next strike is when I have to take your phone. And I really don't want to do that. And he was like, okay, 30 seconds later, he's picking up his phone. And I'm like, hey, what did we just talk about? And he put it down and he goes, Miss Greasy, I don't even know why I picked that up. Mm. I don't even know why I picked that up. And I was like, I know that's the problem. It's like a tick. It's like an addiction. Like you didn't need to it look is. at your phone right then. And 30 seconds before, we just talked about how oh, you better not do it again. But yeah, it's almost like another appendage. It's a subconscious reflex. People yeah. just pick up their phones, put it down, pick it up. And they mm -hmm. don't even know they're doing it. Absolutely. Or you pick it up with a purpose and get distracted. And when you put it down, you're like, why did I even pick that up? There was something I was going to do with it, but I did 28 other things instead. <laughs> it's like you enter a maze and you go down one aspect of the maze and then you find yourself in another and 
it's absolutely crazy how people waste time yes. scrolling and not contemplating the things that really do matter in their lives. Because the one thing with time is you can't have it twice. You can't get it back. Yeah. And that's one thing Penelope says. She feels like if she enrolls and learns her date of departure, that knowledge will dominate her life in a way that cell phones do. Yeah. Uh, and there would be no going back. You can't unknow information. So if she gets that information, her life will be changed in a way that she does not believe will be productive, fulfilling, or meaningful. She sees all the people around her, and they're just obsessed with when they're going to die, and they're crafting their lives around their death. And Penelope sees that as very counterproductive and very sad. I was reading an article about neurons, and what neuroscientists have found is that when you see something, and you see it often, these neurons wire together. And the phrase, once you see something, you can't unsee it. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why. Makes sense. Uh, just going back to the doctor, because he mentions that today was potentially the old woman's death day. How does the acknowledgement of death days influence characters' attitudes and behaviors in this society? Yeah, it influences all of them differently. In a previous draft, I had death day diary entries from various people at various ages, at various stages of life. And I was using those to explore how a variety of individuals might respond to this information. In the case of Dr. Zeit, which Zeit is German for time, he is, he's looking at it from a very clinical standpoint, right? Um, a very practical, pragmatic standpoint. And so for him as a medical professional, He's just weighing the time Penelope might have against the time the woman has left, which is very little. And so for him, he's seeing it completely on a practical level. Like, why did you make this choice? She's going to die today anyway. And Penelope's, I didn't know that. Maybe she, for all Penelope knows, the woman could have had five or 10 more years left. She was old, but she wasn't decrepit. And the doctor sees it more as because you don't know when anyone else is going to die, but they do. You are responsible for your own actions. Live and let live, right? Or die, right. Life, whichever you like in this case. The doctor is saying, everyone knows their death day. She's responsible for herself. You're responsible for yourself to, to make sure you make it to that day. Because, of course, this knowledge does not account for accidents. Your death day could come sooner if you get hit by a car, if you have some other terrible accident. But the society has insulated itself so much from those possibilities that it's a very rare case that someone is injured in or dies in an accident. Mm. Because Penelope contemplates the significance of her impulsive act and the potential impact on the elderly woman's death day, her, her last day. Mm -hmm. And it made me wonder, how does this reflection add depth to the exploration of fate, choices, and the value of time in the narrative? Yeah, because of course, like we were talking about earlier, time can be measured in a variety of ways. Largely in Western culture, we value time in terms of the quantity of time. Mm. But we also need to consider the quality of time. And so I think in Penelope's standpoint, not knowing the quantity of her time, she's more interested in making sure that her time unfolds in such a way that it's meaningful. Not necessarily that it's plentiful, but that it's meaningful. And so she thinks from her standpoint, she's, okay, this woman's going to die today anyway, but I did allow her more time today. And there are 50 million things, meaningful things to her that she made it, may have wanted to experience, achieve, or accomplish today before she dies. And I helped give that to her. I gave her a better quality of time and death because now she will be able to do those things. Now, at that point in the story, people don't know the time they will die. So for all Penelope knows, the woman only has another hour. But that's another hour she was entitled to that now she gets to live. And she would not have made it that far had Penelope not intervened. Reading through the chapters, I'm seeing all these different elements. And what, what I'm trying to do here is go through several of the chapters to give listeners a flavor of the book, yeah. uh, but also of the concept as well. And if I could move on to chapter three, because 
I made the note that Marshall's annual death day diary entry is October 10th, 2044. Mm-hmm. And he's reflecting on the significance of birthdays compared to death days. And he observes the impact of knowing his expected end on his daily life, such as contemplating grocery expiration dates and finding solace in the simple act of shopping. And what I saw in that is as he navigates through his day and reveals his routine and his thoughts on retirement and interactions with colleagues, it gave me an insight into his coping mechanisms and his relationship with his dog, Toby, and the complexities of living with the knowledge and it, of an expected end. Because he draws a distinction between the significance of birthdays and death days, how does this distinction influence his perspective on time and the events in his life? Yeah, so Marshall is a very matter-of-fact sort of man. And so he, for me, this would all be very emotional, I think. If I mm. found out my death day, my reaction would be emotional. Marshall's is very pragmatic and practical, but it has made him appreciate things that he may not otherwise have appreciated or noticed. He talks in that diary entry about how, for him, going to the grocery store is a small pleasure that mm. he appreciates more now because it's not something that he's likely to be able to do after October 10th, 2044. Cooking for him is a small pleasure. And really, I think I was just trying to convince myself of these things as I wrote <laughs> his, because I, I, I enjoy very few domestic tasks. <laughs> I, I don't like grocery shopping. I, I don't particularly like cooking, cleaning, but I very much wish I did because they are things that you have to do to live every day. But I think if I learned how limited my time was, regardless of if it was limited to a year or two or limited to 52 years, I do think that maybe would give me the, the capacity to savor these types of things. Whereas even making that, even having that realization, I'm still incapable of savoring them now. If I'm grocery shopping, I'm doing it as fast as I can so I can get to the thing that I do want to do, like hike or paddleboard or take a nap, pleasurable things that seem meaningful. Chores don't seem meaningful, but because Marshall knows how limited his time is, he's able to see the beauty and the satisfaction of doing these chores that one has to do simply for physical survival. He can savor them. Whereas most people, as he mentions, have decided that the grocery store is a chore that wastes the time they have. They'd rather be doing something more exciting or more interesting or more entertaining than go to the grocery store. But Marshall's able to go, no, going to the grocery store is a part of life that I will not always be able to do. Even if I live up until my death day, that doesn't mean I can grocery shop up until my death day. What if I'm in a home? What if I'm immobile? What if I'm bedridden? I want to savor this task while I can. Yeah, he finds solace from what I've gleaned in grocery shopping as a therapeutic activity. He does. Yeah, he does. And I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, how does his attitude towards mundane tasks like shopping reflect the societal impact of knowing one's death day? Yeah, so society as a whole seems to have decided that mundane tasks are not worth the time. When you know how limited your time is, you would rather delegate those mundane tasks. They have artificial intelligence called Felix. And so the things that they don't want to do, like grocery shop or cook, they employ a Felix to do. Because the Felix isn't worried about how much time it has left. It doesn't have a death day. It doesn't have a, a sense of enjoyment or not, or fulfillment or not. A lot of people have abandoned these mundane tasks that we have to do to get by and to survive and to eat in favor of more what they would consider enriching activities and let the chores fall to the Felix. And the way he reflects on the significance of his annual death day diary entry, to me, emphasizes the shift in perspective that comes with knowing one's death day as he contemplates the idea of expiration dates on groceries and connects them to the finite nature of human life. Mm -hmm. And it made me wonder, do we often consider the temporality of everyday items and by extension, our own mortality, and how might 
acknowledging the impermanence of things impact our approach to life? Because I have never looked at a grocery item and said, oh, what if I die before this expires? I look at my grocery items and go, will I make this dish in time before this expires? <laughs> it's, it's never on an existential level. It's more of a practical level. And Marshall is looking at these expiration dates on a very existential level that probably would not occur to someone who could live under the illusion that they have. Really, if you think about it, to us, it could seem like we have forever. Because although we know we're going to die, I think for a lot of people, that's a very abstract idea. It's someday and someday can feel very far away. Someday in the future can feel impossible, right? It just doesn't feel like it exists. I exist here and now and that is in the future and I don't really need to think about it. But because Marshall has his death day, that gives all dates a new significance, in particular expiration dates because he does see this parallel between his own expiration date and the expiration date of like canned goods that can last for a couple of years. He's oh, that's interesting. When I only have a couple of years left in 2042, some of my groceries might still be good and I'll be gone. <laughs> the awareness of your limited time, how, how does that influence your appreciation for everyday experiences and relationships? That's such a good question. And that was like, part of what I was trying to explore with this novel. And I have to say that even having worked on this novel for several years and really thought about these questions and tried to imagine myself in the position of different individuals and how each individual would feel with this knowledge, I still don't know that I know an answer. I, I, I guess the question I ask myself when I'm trying to make big and small decisions is, in the grand scheme of my life, when I'm gone, or when I'm very old, which of these decisions will I be happier that I made? Which of these decisions is going to make me feel more fulfilled down the road? Which is a future leaning way to look at things. But if I make my decision solely based on what is going to be instantaneously gratifying, that usually isn't the decision that's going to be the most fulfilling. Mm. And so even though, who knows, I, I hope I won't, but something could happen next week. When I'm gone, are people going to look back on me and my life and be proud of the decisions I made and know that I felt fulfilled and proud of the decisions I made? I don't know. For me, it's still a very open question. Yeah. And that's um, a, even, that's a... even as I'm trying to explain it to you, when I hear myself saying what I'm saying, the real answer is I just don't know. I'm at, that's a beautiful place to be because I think that with instant gratification, it's soon ripe, soon rotten. Yes. When you look at the symbology of a question mark, it's a hook, not just a full stop. It's a hook to get you to the next part of the question. And for me, it, it's not always about having an answer. It's about can the question survive the answer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> that really puts everything on its head, flips everything on its head. Exactly. It that way. Are there any aspects of your life or lives that you've come into contact with where you or others have neglected to acknowledge their impermanence? And how might this impact overall well being? Yeah, I, I don't know if this is privilege or naivety. I don't know. I have a very close friend who is grappling with some sense of mortality, and it's been really informative and really fascinating and really emotional to watch him ask these questions from a very personal, very real standpoint. Because, of course, when I ask myself these questions, it's all hypothetical. I don't have any particular diagnosis. I don't have a prognosis. I don't have a death day that I can point to on a calendar. So for me, as an individual, it's all very abstract. It's all still an open question, like I said. And that's not true for everybody. But I haven't come in contact personally with many people who an expiration date is a very real, concrete aspect in their daily life. 
In chapter four, I was looking at the conversation between Penelope and her friend, is it Bea? Yes, I say Bea. Everyone else says B, but she's Bea. Bea, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's about the enrollment and the experiment, the process that reveals one's DOD, date of departure. I see that Bea encourages Penelope to consider enrolling, emphasizing the benefits of planning for the future. And Penelope remains resistant because she views the idea of knowing her date of departure as morbid. And to me, what I've gleaned from it is that it explores the societal impact of enrollment and contrasting perspectives on planning for death and living in the present, Mm -hmm. because Penelope reflects on the contrast between planning for a wedding and planning for a funeral, questioning the purpose of living when life becomes entangled with the anticipation of death. In terms of Bayer's suggestion of enrolling in the experiment together with Penelope and Everett. How does societal pressure influence individuals' decision regarding enrollment? And how does Penelope resist this pressure? Yeah, so in Penelope's view, she is planning for the future because she's planning a wedding and she's planning a life with Everett and they're planning a family. And for her, that is the future. Whereas the majority of people in her society, the future is the end. (laughs) And they're planning for the ultimate future, their death. For Penelope, she wants to plan for what she knows in her life. I know I'm in love with Everett. I know I'm going to marry him. I know we want children. What things do I need to do now to prepare for that future? For a home, for a career, for a marriage, for a family. Whereas Bea has a longer term view because she is planning for her departure from this life. And by Penelope's view, that is a waste of life, that just planning for death means you miss all of these great things that you could experience in your life if you weren't so focused on the end of your life. And most of society lands where Bea is and feels like planning for this ultimate end is the best type of planning one can do. It's the most practical It's the most informed, the best informed, and that to plan for anything less is somewhat irresponsible. One thing Bea tells Penelope is you like planning so much and you're so responsible and you're so organized. I can't believe you don't want this information to plan for. And and later in the book, I don't know how far you've gotten, so I won't say much about this, but later in the book, Penelope finds herself in a situation where Bea's argument almost makes sense when she tells Penelope that not planning for her death is is irresponsible and selfish. Because it reveals Penelope's priorities and perspectives on life and death. Yes. And the conversation between Penelope and Bea really touches on the theme of uncertainty. How does uncertainty play a role in their perspectives of life and death? And How does it shape their attitudes towards enrollment in the experiment? So Penelope sees uncertainty and risk as inherently a part of life and accepts that fact. And Bea doesn't because Bea knows her death day and has known her death day for a very long time and can't imagine not having that knowledge. And so for Penelope, she feels like people who know their death days are not fully engaged in life because there is no inherent risk. There is no unknown except for what happens beyond death and that she feels that kind of cuts them off from a deep experience of vitality, that when they're so focused on the end of their lives, they are missing the present part of their life that they could be experiencing. And she sees that with Bea all the time because Bea really wants to get married before she dies and Bea is going to die somewhat young and Bea is so invested in this idea that she wants to experience love and marriage that she misses a lot of opportunities to really live in Penelope's view. It makes me wonder about how often do we actually discuss end-of-life planning with our loved ones? Do you think there are cultural or societal taboos that hinder open conversations about death? That varies by family and by individuals and their relationships. I think that it's pretty normalized for people to have wills planned. And I think it's pretty normalized for people to have 
living wills and that those are very practical things that are talked about. But in a culture where everyone knows when they're going to die, I think those things take on a greater importance because the date of death is so concrete when you have to have these things done by, which is one of the benefits of enrolling in this book, because it's easy for us in today's society. And maybe this is why people don't. It's easy to think I'm only 42 and I don't have kids. I don't need a will yet. I've got 30, 40 years to go. But that might not be true. (laughs) And so I think it's easy for us to not talk about these things if we don't know when we're going to die. Whereas in a society where you do know when, it's easier to talk about them because it's a matter of practicality. In your view, what ways can open discussions about death benefit individuals and society as a whole? I think it could be beneficial in many ways, depending on how it's handled, because just like in this book, you don't want people or society to be so focused on death that there's a morbidity to everything. Mm. But I think that open discussions about end of life can probably enhance the way that we live our lives in a way that we're making decisions that will be the most meaningful and fulfilling to us and also be the most meaningful and fulfilling and beneficial to the people that we love that might be left behind when we're gone. It's hard, even having written this book and really thought about these things for so long, it's still hard for me to conceptualize what it would be like to know when I'm going to die. And depending on that date, my reaction would be different. I am still very much in Penelope's unenrolled status, right? I don't know my death day. I know my birthday. I know all the things I think I'm going to get to do and experience. And maybe like her, I've accepted that's part of life, that the mystery of when is part of existing. And maybe that's a privilege. Maybe ignorance is bliss. And the fact that I don't know when allows me not to worry about when. It It gives me a certain freedom to assume that I have until I'm old so that I can live in in the present in a certain way. I think if we talked about death, too much as a society, we do lose some of the privilege of living for the moment. Mm. In, in direct contrast to Penelope, Bayer, who's this enthusiastic participant in the experiment, she mm-hmm. finds solace in the certainty of her death day. The idea of living without knowing when life might end seems too abstract and filled with delusions of eternity. And Mm -hmm. in the book, I think she compares it to working on a project with no deadline, which suggests that having a set endpoint motivates her to accomplish tasks. And she embraces the clarity that her death day provides, because I, I guess it offers a tangible sense of time. And in reflecting on this, knowing the deadline of her life brings possibly an intrinsic motivation and purpose. Mm -hmm. How does the concept of having a clear endpoint influence our approach to goals and aspirations in real life? Do we tend to procrastinate or delay our plans when faced with uncertainty about the future? I think we probably do. Honestly, I think most people tend to procrastinate even when there's not uncertainty. (laughs) Even when you know the date of your deadline for something and it's approaching, procrastination is still, I think, a habit slash problem for many people. I don't have that problem. I've never been a procrastinator. I'm very much self-motivated and I see time as a resource that I can use wisely or waste according to my priorities in that moment. And honestly, yeah, we could have a whole talk about waste the value, you know, oh, yeah. what wasted time is. That's a whole other rabbit hole that we could go down. Well, one of the, the contemplations I had about this is that if there wasn't a set endpoint, you know, in the absence of a set endpoint, how do you then navigate the balance between living in the present mm-hmm. and planning for the future? Because does the uncertainty of time impact one's decision making and how might a different perspective on time influence our actions and priorities? Yes. So I think that not knowing when a deadline is or when you're going to die does allow you a certain freedom to live in the present more than if you did know. 
Whereas having the deadline, even if you're procrastinating, you have that hanging over you. You have to get it done before that deadline or there will be consequences. I do think, too, though, that as you see with Bea, she has the deadline and she's very enthusiastic and she's very motivated, but she's putting a lot of pressure on herself to meet these self-imposed deadlines before she dies and she's not succeeding. And that is causing her suffering that Penelope sees as unnecessary. Because if Bea was not so set on, oh, I want to make sure I get married in time to celebrate my 25th wedding anniversary. And if I don't get married by this day, I'll be dead before I'm married to my spouse for 25 years. Penelope's, you're cheating yourself out of a lot of enjoyable people and a lot of enjoyable experiences because you are just constantly checking for together forever and doing the math in your head of if you date this person, Will you both be alive long enough to do X, Y, and Z? And for Bea, life has become a math equation. If you think about it, it's been reduced to this equation of if I do this now, will I have time to reach this point in whatever it is before I die? And then if she's not, she doesn't want to do it. So she's cheating herself out of things. And Penelope talks about other people doing the same thing. Like, oh, I don't want to have children because I'm going to die before they're married and I won't get to see my grandkids or I don't want to have children because I don't want to leave them without a mom when they're so young or I don't want to get a dog because I'm probably going to die before the dog and then what even though they could plan for that Penelope sees people using their deadline as an excuse to not do what would otherwise be viewed as very fulfilling meaningful things I like the way you drop bombs in the book because There's a universal disruption to Marshall's life because in the chapters, he's caught in the routine of his daily life. And then this sudden thrill, this mysterious and beautiful woman enters the cafe. And then there's the struggle with the desire to break free from his usual Mm -hmm. habits. Mm -hmm. And the mundane surroundings transform in the presence of this woman as it, as it would do. And then he grapples with the conflict between his desire for connection and the fear of potential rejection. So does he approach this woman? Because he clearly he feels this surge of excitement and possibility. But it made me wonder about how often do we resist breaking from our routines or our comfort zone or hesitating to approach new opportunities or people due to fear? I think we do that all the time, depending on our personality. Everyone's different in that regard, but I think that a lot of people probably let opportunities pass by because of insecurities or fears they have about the consequences of making whatever leap it is they're going to make. And even Marshall worries about that in that moment. And then just when he decides to take the leap, decides, what do I have to lose? Uh, Something changes his mind. And I think the thing for Marshall too, and for all the, the characters that we have to consider, is Marshall knows how much time he has left, and he has a long time. His knowledge perhaps affects him less than Bea's, for example, because Marshall is going to live to a fairly ripe old age. And it probably still feels somewhat abstract to him. If you get your death day and it's 60 years away, that feels a lot different than getting a death day that's six years away regardless of your age, probably, to some degree. And so he probably feels, in his given his personality and given how much time he does have left, there is maybe less of an urgency for him to take these social and personal risks than there might be for somebody like Bea, who has very clear life goals and a death day that's approaching far sooner than Marshall's. The arrival of this mysterious woman brought a renewed perspective on his life. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about my own routines and my habits, my general habitual living. And it made me wonder about the aspects of my daily life that might benefit from a change or a fresh perspective. And so my question to you is, are there any aspects of your daily life that might benefit from a change or a fresh perspective? Oh, I'm sure. (laughs) I'm sure there are. (laughs) It would take a while to consider what they might be, but uh, 100%, yes. How do you balance the comfort of, say, routine with the potential for unexpected, invigorating experiences? 
really good question. And this is something I've thought about many times. There was, I wish I could remember who it was. I think he was a famous musician, a very accomplished musician. And he always, he followed a very strict routine. Like, I mean, down to eating the same thing for lunch every single day. Mm. Because he found that if he did the same thing at the same time every day, then more of his mind was freed up for creativity. He didn't have to spend time contemplating, oh, what am I going to eat for lunch today? Oh, what am I going to wear tomorrow? He knew and he did not deviate. Those things were decided. And then he felt more of his brain and mind and thought was freed up to consider his creative process and his creative uh, endeavors instead of worrying about the mundane. And for me, there's definitely a value in routine and structure for that same reason. Things are more streamlined if you have a routine. When you travel, for example, and you're out of your normal place and all of your toiletries are in a toiletry bag, it <laughs> might take a little longer to get ready because you got to dig for this, you got to dig for that. Whereas at home, you just know where everything is. It's mindless. You go through your routine. You're out the door in 20 minutes traveling. Maybe it's 30 minutes because it's a different configuration in the bathroom and your clothes are somewhere in a suitcase and all these different things. And so while change can be refreshing, there is a certain investment in change, at least temporarily, while you adjust to whatever routine you have changed. And so I think depending on the change, it can be beneficial or detrimental. In the case of that famous musician, who I'm going to have to Google after we're done talking because it will drive me crazy, a change for him, he would have seen as very detrimental because it would have taken some of his mental energy away from mm. where he wanted it devoted. Any kind of routine that you practice or any practice, even like writing, brings about a density. And that density can then determine your destiny. Mm -hmm. Because you layer it in, you build it like a muscle. Routine is very important. I, I remember seeing it with my niece's daughter, a young three and a half year old, where she doesn't want routine in the way that parents want routine for right. her. But there is a kind of organized chaos about it. There is a coherence that comes out of that chaos. Was there ever a moment in your life when you embraced change or spontaneity? And how did that experience influence, if you had that sort of experience, you influence your outlook and well-being? Were there any barriers or fears that you recognize that may have hindered you from incorporating more variety or novelty into your daily life. I am a creature of habit and I love predictability and I love plans. <laughs> but one thing that came to mind for me immediately when you asked this question was back in February, a really close friend of mine who was getting ready to move out of the country, she and I, we had always wanted to go to the state park that was six or seven hours from our home where there were wild ponies. And when she decided she was going to move back to Europe, we realized we had a limited amount of time to make this happen. And it was December when she made that decision. And this park is in the mountains. And we decided we needed to go before she left. And we were just texting. And I was like, hey, we need to get to Grayson Highlands. And she was like, yeah, when? And I was like, let's go President's Day weekend. It's a long weekend. Let's make it happen. And she was just OK. So we made this plan and we went. And that in itself was somewhat spontaneous because going to the mountains in the winter is maybe not the wisest thing. I have a little tiny compact car. It doesn't have four-wheel drive, et cetera. <laughs> and then when we got there, we had such a beautiful time that I looked at a map and I said, hey, we could just drive home like we planned, or we could hit three more state parks and do three more hikes on our way. And she was like, OK, let's do it. So at the last minute, we decided that we were going to stop at all these different recreational outdoor places and do a hike and then get back in the car and go to the next one. It took us like 15 hours to get home. But that weekend, that trip that we were forced into planning because it was now or never, it's one of my favorite recent memories. Uh, I look back on it and I'm so glad we did that. And I'm so glad that we took our time getting home and stopped at all those places. I'm so glad that I was with somebody who made me feel comfortable enough making that spontaneous choice and who also was game for doing that with me. Mm, that's beautiful to have a companion like that who instills trust in the process. And it, it reminded me, uh, I can't remember which chapter it was, but I know that Marshall grapples with the intricacies of trust and he finds 
solace in the silent companionship of his loyal canine friend, Toby, and the routine of his office life and the upcoming obligation to order a death day cake feels like a burden overshadowing this newfound vibrancy that was inspired by this mysterious woman. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me he contemplates the duality of his emotions, the emptiness left by his mother's betrayal, and the potential for connection the beautiful woman symbolizes. And in moments of emotional complexity, people often find comfort in the presence of loyal companions. In terms of companionship in your life, whether it's a pet or a friend or a family member, how does the presence of others influence your emotional well-being during challenging times? This is something that's a very timely question for me. And I think the, how the presence of others affects me in trying times depends on who the others are and how they're being affected. I think my natural tendency is probably to withdraw and to almost feel if I'm facing a challenge or a hardship, it almost feels intrusive to me if someone wants to be present or wants to help or I'm surprised by it. I don't expect it. But in times when I have let that presence or that assistance in, it's always been for the better. It's always been gratifying. It's always been meaningful. But I think my first, for whatever reason, my first instinct is always no. <laughs> when we lost two of our dogs in 2019, we had some close friends back then who really wanted to be part of the sort of farewell process and grieving process. And we did let them into that. But I remember at first being very resistant to that, like almost feeling like, no, this is my pain. This is my grief. This is not your pain to bear. Almost just not even out of protection for them, but for myself, feeling like my grief was being intruded upon. And that ultimately wasn't what it was at all. But in my pain, that was my first reaction. Marshall's longing for connection is juxtaposed against the backdrop of his reluctance to trust. And for me, that raised much broader questions about the human need for connection mm -hmm. and the challenges posed by past emotional wounds. And when I consider my own journey in seeking connection, and maybe you'd like to consider your journey in seeking connection, how have past experiences shaped your approach to forming new connections? And how do you navigate the balance between vulnerability and self-protection? I find relationships very fascinating and very complicated and very challenging. I think part of it is from the number of times I moved in my life when I was growing up. I would form these really deep, good friendships, and then I would move and have to start over again, trying to form new friendships. And of course, the older you get, the more people you meet who've already established friendships and maybe don't necessarily need you the way that you need them because you are not established in, in a social circle mm -hmm. in this new place. And they are. For me, I think I like everyone. <laughs> I pretty much like everyone that I meet. I enjoy people's company very much. I enjoy social interaction. I'm very outgoing. But I do find it very challenging to move beyond the acquaintance phase. I find the vulnerability part extremely difficult, which is something I've really been thinking about and exploring a lot on an introspective level. Like, why would that be? Why is that that I have so much trouble letting people in on a deeper level than how was your weekend, how's your day going type of small talk. That's a good place to be. That's an exploration. Do you explore or do you exploit the situation? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a very eloquent way to, to put it. I'm definitely in the exploration phase. I think I told you back in the summer when we spoke, man, I recently had a lot of friends move away. And so those established connections that had been established for several years were suddenly long distance connections, which changes the nature of the relationship dramatically. And so trying to think about what my next steps will be socially and think about the people I already know and the people I have yet to meet and how they could fit into fulfilling relationships is, is complicated. 
especially when you like everyone. And that's not always the case when you're in a place where people have already very established long time friendships and relationships. The more you get to know people, the more challenging it is to form groups where everyone gets along. I feel like that character that's like, why can't everyone just get along? I just want to be friends with all of you. (laughs) It's really hard when you don't want to be friends with each other. Amanda, we wrap up. This is just fascinating and I haven't really covered much of what I wanted to talk to you about because there's so much within the book. I've only read up to chapter 15 because I'm totally immersed in it and in the characters. And for me, it brings up broader questions about life and about my own life and my own situation and how I think about my life. It's a wonderful piece of work. It's more than a piece of work. For me, it's almost like a manual for living and for dying, if you will, because it brings up those perennial questions. Do you have any parting words at all? And where can people find you? Dash, I feel like this is the time where in a week I'll be like, I should have said X, Y, and Z. I I don't have any wise words to leave people with. I hope that if they choose to read this book, it will open up questions for them to explore in ways that will allow them to maybe access a more meaningful perspective or live a more meaningful and fulfilling life. I have a website. It's just Amanda Sue Creasy with an EY dot com. I'm on Instagram. My handle's the same, Amanda Sue Creasy. And I would love to connect. I would love that. I'd love for people to reach out and find me. But yeah, I always wish I had wise words to impart at the end of something, but but I just don't. Your book is is a testament to that intrinsic wisdom, because I think the the whole concept of T minus ex- an, an expected end is an incredible concept because it's flipped everything on its head, and I think it brings into society the wider conversation and the deeper conversations. We need to have about death. We need to have about life because I think death informs life. But I want to thank you so much. And it's been an honor and a privilege to know you. It's been an honor and a privilege to speak with you and to be privy to reading this material because for me, it's brought up a lot of questions. Good. That is what I'm hoping for. And where can people buy the book? Uh, It is available on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, bookshop.org. Those are probably the top three places they can get it. If they go to my website, there's links there to the Amazon shop, the Barnes & Noble shop, and the bookshop.org shop. Abe Books also carries it. So almost anywhere that you can get books online, you can find the book. Beautiful. And what's been your experience today? My experience has been that you are an excellent interviewer. You have posed some questions that I'll be thinking about after this interview. And in much the same way that when the book came out, I immediately wanted to make improvements. I know that I'll be thinking back on this interview and new ideas are going to occur to me to explore based on the questions that that you asked. What are you most proud of? Gosh, this is probably a very disappointing answer, but I'm just proud that I have a book in the world. Is there anything else in the pipeline? Yes, uh, I'm working on my second novel. It's actually the first manuscript I ever wrote. And come New Year's, I'm going to be ramping up efforts on wrapping that up, hopefully in 2024. So yes, that that is in the pipeline. Stay in touch. And I'd love to have you back if you want to come back and explore your new manuscript. Just reach out and let me know. Thank you. And thank you for today. This was great. This was really beautiful. You're most welcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your, I guess it's probably evening for you. Yes, it is. Thanks again. It's been a real pleasure to know you and to conduct this interview with you. Thank you. You too. That's it for today's episode of Transcendent Minds. We hope you enjoyed this exploration of the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And if you feel inclined, please leave a rating and a review as this goes a long way. And follow us on social media to stay up to date with the latest episodes. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, keep transcending your mind.